Jared Roney from Advantage Feeders. Today we're going to be looking at the final results from our creep feeding experiment. So we've compared six different feed types against two control groups and we've got the results today of the profitability of each group but also we'll be looking at the analysis of which feed types were most practical and easy to use. The primary reason behind this experiment is that we've had the creep panels on the market uh, allowing farmers to creep feed their lambs for 10 years now and through the whole time farmers have been asking us what feed to use, which one's most profitable, which one works easiest. So now some of the real questions we've been really trying to get to the bottom of and as far as we can see and we've done a lot of searching on the internet no trial has ever been done really comparing feed types for in a creep feeding setting both in lambs and in cattle actually so um, we're really happy to be able to share these results before we look at the results we're going to discuss the challenges that we have um, probably the primary one is consistent feed flow so through creep feeding it's often cold coldest and wettest time of the year and just the natural humidity can make feed uh, stop flowing I suppose or really cause them to bridge a little bit so we had a range of different feed types and probably the one hassle we had was uh, feed type 6 so that was the 80% cracked grain 20% high protein pellet and when we had some really driving windy weather the the high protein pellets really swelled up and, and stopped the flow. So that happened once through the 11 week trial. Another observation is that the commercial crack grain mixes, that's being like the ones made up of corn, barley, wheat and protein ingredients, didn't flow as well as the whole wheat, cracked wheat and wheat and pellet feed varieties. So it meant that we wouldn't want to be going viewing feeders any le less frequently than on a weekly basis because um, just with the the feed flow kind of s slowing so on a weekly basis those ones we definitely had to put our finger in or, or another object in to free up where they're looking out of feed flow varied between each type of feed so when the lambs were six to seven weeks of age and their intake started hitting that 200 grams a day we had to start using the adjusters on the feeder being the upper and lower adjuster to start restricting intake so that they wouldn't consume over consume so every feed was a bit different so um, the straight wheat was the hardest one to control so we had to really wind the adjusters back and and at the end of the trial and those familiar with our feeders we had the upper and lower adjuster at hole three so there are 15 millimeters uh, depth of feed flowing through and they're putting their tongue into a 15 millimeter groove so wheat was definitely the hardest one to control and even at the end of the trial at that setting they did reach 250 grams a day average so um, that's one thing to note and it is important to record how much they are eating over time because through the trial we found that it did really change over time so um, we had to just on a weekly basis just check what the intake was and adjust the feeders when that intake was a bit higher than what we wanted. Disappointingly feed type 6 not only had the issue with the clogging but later in the second half of the trial the health of the lambs uh, visually deteriorated and on closer inspection the high protein pellets that were in the feed were going crumbly and you could see little sections of mold so the microtoxins within um, didn't uh, help the lambs in this environment with this feed so it's probably a really good conclusion that this feed type isn't suited to creep feeding we've got to remember we've got cold uh, humid uh, situation with very you know pretty small um, intake so the feed is in the feeder for a long uh, relatively long period of time so um, that was a real learning for this experiment. Just before we get to the results, we've got to make the observation about the variability between each group. So the main variable is the lamb survival in each group. 
Some groups had better survival, which means that the ewes are sharing their milk over two lambs compared to the groups that had the lesser survival and with more single lambs on their mother having um, more milk. So that's probably the biggest variable. The other one is just obviously we've done our best to set up each group on pastures that are identical as possible. But when you've got eight groups and they move to a different pasture and then you need another eight uh, pastures, it adds an extra variable. And so we've done our best to be as close pasture type in each group, but that's one thing to keep in mind when we're looking through the results. The first result we'll look at is feed conversion. So every feed has a different price and that's somewhat correlated to the feed conversion. However, we'll go through them individually. So the whole wheat had a feed conversion of six to one. The cracked wheat had quite a good feed conversion at 3.7 to one. The Ridley uh, cracked grain mix had a conversion of 3.7 to one. And likewise, the Ridley uh, lamb finishing pallet with the wheat, also 3.7 to one. And the best result in this trial was the reed stock feed cracked grain mix that had a 2.5 to one feed conversion. What's really pleasing overall, that average across all the groups, the feed conversion was 3.3 to one. So they all yeah, had a very good feed conversion overall. The next set of results we'll look at is the average daily weight gain above the control groups. So how much faster they're growing than the control groups. Both the wheat and the cracked wheat group were growing 55 grams per day above the control group. The Ridley cracked grain mix were growing 44 grams per day above the control group. The Ridley uh, commercial lamb finishing pallets mixed with the wheat, they were growing 56 grams per day above the control group. And the reed stock feeds crack grain mix were growing 59 grams per day above the control group. So when we average those five groups out, they, it worked out to be 53 grams per day. So a really solid improvement on the control group. The next set of results we'll look at is a profit per lamb. So this is a key result to have been uh, wanting to see the results for. So for the whole wheat group, it ended up being $9.66 um, profit after we take out the feed input costs. Um, the cracked grain mix uh, ended up being $11.58 per lamb. So that was uh, just the best group. The next best was the reed stock feed group being $11.46. So that was the group that had the most expensive feed, but the best feed conversion. Um, the Ridley cracked grain mix ended up being $7.29 um, per lamb profit. And the Ridley um, commercial lamb finishing pallet mixed with the wheat, that ended up being $10.36 um, profit per lamb. So when we look at the average per lamb, it works out just a touch over $10 a head, being $10.07. So across the five groups, the uh, profitability has been uh, quite good. And that profitability is based on lambs at $4 per kilogram. So um, we're turning them off to about 25 kilogram lambs or 30 kilogram lambs. So that price is obviously quite variable but um, $4 is probably a, a good long-term average for those uh, weaned lambs. Yeah. The final set of results we'll look at is profit per ewe. We discussed earlier about how we had different amount of lamb survival in each group. So each group started with equal amount of twins and a few triplets in each group. However, the results at marking were a bit variable. So this is quite an important measure to look at. So in the whole wheat group, the profit was 
and 37 cents per U after we take out the feed costs. The cracked wheat group was $17.91. The reed uh, cracked grain mix was $17.58 per U. The Ridley cracked grain mix was $12.58. And the Ridley uh, pallet mixed with the wheat group, that was um, a touch better being $17.59 per U. With the average being $16.41. So again, yeah, really um, good results with lamb at $4 per kilogram. I'd like to address a lot of the questions that we had going into the trial and one of the key ones was how much protein do we need in a creep feed to give us great results and in the first video we talked about how some of the feeds vary in protein from 14 to 18 percent and that the pasture is likely to be about 25 percent and the mother's milk is going to have high protein as well so is it important? And what we found in the different feed types is that it didn't seem to be important at all because the lambs are still getting a lot of protein from their mother and from the pasture. Another question we had was, did making the starch uh, more available through cracking or feeding pellets, was that uh, gonna lead to more profit? And while it hasn't led to a lot more profit, what has been the key takeaway is the feed conversion is much better. So when we look at the whole wheat, they had a feed conversion of six to one, whereas the other four groups that um, had cracked grain or made up of pallets, they had a feed conversion averaging about three. So um, that was really quite interesting. Another question we had was, in the groups that had whole wheat, was that going to bypass the rumen and effectively be wasted? And what's been really pleasing, and even in those groups that had the whole wheat, it was very, very difficult to find any whole grains in the dung. So the digestion of those whole wheats has been really quite good. Another question we had was, would barley be a good substitute instead of wheat? And it really depends on the price of both commodities. Um, when we started the trial, the both feeds were very close in price. So per megajoule and per uh, kilogram of starch, wheat worked out cheaper, but things have changed quite a bit and look like changing going into harvest here. So barley is definitely a viable option. And a lot of farmers uh, use this um, feed source and with the starch content of about 65%, that is uh, a little bit more than the commercial cracked grain mixes would have used and the pellet grain mix would have used as well. So it will have adequate starch to really drive that room in Felton. Another question we have is, what impact will a changing land price have on the profitability of creep feeding? And what we've done, we're plugging the numbers and in our report at the end, we'll have a matrix with varying prices for each feed type to show what profit is generated. But just overall of the five groups, if we drop lamb as low as $3 a kilogram, it comes out at $6 per lamb um, profit. And if we increase it to $5 a kilogram, it raises from $10 a lamb to $14 a lamb. So um, it has a bit of an impact on profit, but even when prices decrease quite a lot, it is still quite a profitable exercise. The final question we had was, what difference will changing feed prices have on the profitability of creep feeding? So again, we'll, in the trial report, we'll have a matrix of feed prices and they will generate different profits. Um, so you can see the answer to this in front of you, but just briefly going into the trial, I felt feed prices were above average or historical averages and they have come 
down quite a long way with the main components, uh, potentially barley and wheat uh, reducing significantly in prices. But if we just drop the feed prices by 10%, that adds uh, 60 cents per lamb profitability in this trial. I'd like to acknowledge some of the key people and companies that have contributed to this experiment. First being Phil Stove, who's a local farmer of Ballarat, who was generous enough to go the effort of cracking the wheat for the trial. Um, we had two feed companies, being Reed Stock Feeds and Ridley Stock Feeds, donate their feeds for those particular groups. So much appreciated. And we had Jess Revel from Ruminant Livestock Services, who formulated the rations for the cracked grain mixes. So really like to thank those guys. In conclusion, I think it's fair to say that the things that are easy on our farm get done well, and the things that aren't as easy and have more steps and more time dependent don't get done as well. Um, so when that comes to choosing a creep feed, um, some of the considerations that have been really important for us is what's easy to buy, what's easy to store, um, what's easy to get from our storage into the feeders. Another factor is for us, if we don't eat as much creep feed and we've got a residual, how do we use that? Will it keep to the following year? And then the final one that's pretty important for us as well is uh, if we're not hitting marketable weight and moving lambs into a, a feedlot to finish, um, is that feedlot ration gonna be consistent with what they were creep fed with because if it is it's going to lead to better intake early on in that feedlot. Well it's been very pleasing to see that regardless of the creep feed used within the trial all groups have had a great result. If you've got any further questions please feel free to contact us.